Okay, it's time 11 a.m. Eastern U.S. Um, how are you, everyone? I'm Cherry Kvora. I'm a professor at the Ohio State University. I'm the host of this Optimia Indoor Ag Science Cafe series. This is a part of the project, multi-state project funded by USDA, led by Michigan State University, uh, Ohio State, Uni the Ohio State University, Purdue University, and University of Arizona. The idea is creating information exchange platform, learning um, platform for us, uh, those who are operating indoor farms and then also supporting indoor farms through research and development or technology providing. So with that, um, let's start today's um, contents. So um, today we have a... Um, uh, speaker uh, from CEA Technology. This is a new company name of Robert Colangelo um, talking about right sizing a vertical farm. Um, and then we have uh, actually this is a, a slide for the scheduling um, or upcoming uh, cafe. Um, two more um, cafes uh, planned for this year. Um, if you have been attending this um, cafe, uh, you may notice that more engineering stuff this semester than usual. So um, I think, or well, this is my hope, um, uh, you can learn uh, some of the stuff um, or engineering stuff you may, you know, you may not learn otherwise. So anyway, so those are the um, upcoming cafe. And then all the archives you can find, um, except those who, um, didn't want the recording available, um, but everything else is in our um, uh, archive site, um, Optimia uh, website. And then uh, one quick advertisement um, for those who are new, uh, we are developing uh, learning contents, um, Optimia University, at all kinds of um, <sighs> categories of key information areas such as systems, a plant response, um, economics. So it's a really great stuff. We are still working on, you know, the remaining portion of the lectures, but our goal is to complete this um, by end of uh, year. Um, so stay tuned um, and then you can start learning available um, lectures. All right, so with that, I'm gonna have Robert um, uh, to start presenting. Again, um, he is in a new company or he has multiple companies, I guess. Um, one of them is a CEA Technology Inc. So great to have you back, um, Robert. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kubota. Uh, thanks for the nice introduction. Uh, as uh, Cherry said, I recently launched CEA Technology. We're an ag tech company, and we uh, did research for about three years, and our uh, company engineers and install sustainable growing systems. Uh, our vision is to transform agriculture by building modular, scalable indoor growing systems that can grow in any climate, free of pesticides, using less energy, water, and soil. So I wanted to thank Dr. Kubota for the honorary PhD she gave me in the promotional piece. Uh, I have a master's of science in earth science and my specialty is hydrogeology, so I don't have a PhD. But I first met Dr. Kubota about 10 years ago when she was working at the University of Arizona uh, through my good friend, uh, Jean Giacomelli. She had a very tiny growth chamber and she's always been a dedicated, hardworking professor and researcher uh, putting out very good, reliable information that helped advance the industry. And last week, I had the opportunity to visit and tour the new Ohio State $35 million Controlled Environment Ag Center. I'm very happy for her. All her hard work and patience has paid off. And now she has a state-of-the-art research and training center that can really help advance the industry and really keep the U.S. competitive in this area. Uh, University of Arizona was the catalyst to kickstart CEA, and now you see researchers from Lithuania to Louisiana conducting fantastic R&D to advance this market, and it's just a very exciting time to be involved with agriculture. Um, today, I'm going to share my experience building and operating vertical farms for more than 12 years, and what I see as a path to profitability for vertical farms. 
A big thanks goes to Dr. Kubota and the organizers of Optimum IA for inviting me to present today. Uh, this is an emerging market. Good data is a challenge to get. And so I have no pride in authorship here. And if anyone has any better data than the that that I'm presenting, I'm open to discussion and to review it. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and get started. So for those that don't know, ag tech is an emerging investment sector that came about around 10 years ago. And last year, a record amount of venture capital was placed in ag tech companies, around 50, over $50 billion. Uh, ag tech is a technology focused agribusiness. The goal is to improve current agricultural efficiency and reduce the environmental impact on agriculture. There's also been a recent focus on ESG, and if you're not familiar with ESG, uh, here's a definition. Uh, so investors are becoming more aware of the impact of agriculture on the environment, social and governance, and they're working that into their investment portfolio. When we look at agribusiness, it's made up of multiple sectors, and you could see uh, controlled environment agriculture is one of those sectors. So most of the group here knows what CEA is. The way I define it in simple terms, it's the science of growing crops indoors. And what that does is allow you to have a protected environment that gives you an extended growing season. And there's a wide range of growing technology that can be used depending on the crop from a simple hoop house to a uh, greenhouse, to a glass house with supplemental lighting, to mushroom grow operations, to an indoor vertical farm. So I wanted to put the market in perspective is when you look at uh, the USDA reports, uh, you see that there's over 2.1 million field farms and there's 8,600 greenhouses. It's very hard to find the amount of vertical farms out there, but my best guess is around 200 if anyone has better uh, data, I'm happy to look at it. And this is just in the, the US. So these two markets make up the size of the CEA market. And you could see it's dwarfed by the number of field farms out there. Um, what I see out there is that farming is starting to impact the climate and the climate's impacting farming. So it's getting harder and harder to grow crops outdoors consistently with droughts, severe weather, you know, pests, you're starting to see more agriculture move inside. And that's good for us, but we've got some challenges ahead of us. You know, number one is energy use, you know, conserving soil and water. And that's really what we need to do to move our industry further. Again, to put things in perspective, uh, field farms have been out there for a long time, thousands of years. Greenhouses have been out for hundreds of years. And vertical farms have been out maybe 10, 15 years. So we're the new kid on the block. And we live in a time when immediate's not fast enough. And people have to be patient. You know, vertical farms are still imperfect. We're, we're evolving and getting better. And thanks to all those researchers out there, we're getting much better data that allows us to move faster. But we still are figuring this out. So I think people need to have a little patience when it comes to the market. And this next illust side illustrates this. Um, I wanted to uh, thank Willette Tutali, a good friend of mine who helped me put this chart together. And this uh, took a lot of digging and a lot of time to put together. This data is valid as of July 22nd. And what it shows you is the five vertical farm companies that are well capitalized. And uh, what this uh, color uh, indicates is the amount of capital raised. Uh, this indicates the valuation of the company. And if there is a bar here, it shows how much revenue they've generated. So I've uh, kept this anonymous, uh, uh, not to pick on companies, but to just show where I think the state of the vertical farming industry is. So if you look at A, you could see they've raised about $940 million, almost a billion in capital, and they have a valuation of $2.3 billion, but we could not find revenue data on them. 
If I look at uh, Group B, they've raised about 646 million with a uh, uh, valuation of 2.3 billion. And again, hard to find revenue. These both are privately held companies. When I look at C, they've raised 300 million. They have a valuation of 300, uh, 375 million on revenues of 1.3 million. This company went public via SPAC and uh, you can see their valuation is slightly higher than the amount of capital they've raised. But the, uh, the key here is how little revenue they've generated. Here's another company that is privately held. They have raised 238 million with a valuation of 1.2 billion on a projected revenue this year of 4 million, giving them a valuation of three times, 300 times revenue, which is extremely high. And here's another company that's raised 200 million. It's hard, I uh, could not find valuation or revenue. Um, so from this data, what I've surmised is that we're in an emerging market. And again, we need a little patience. I think we're all trying to figure out what's the best way to be profitable here. Um, many of these companies have little revenue and, and I cannot find any earnings uh, for these companies. Their valuations are extremely high in the 300 to, to 1,000 times revenue. And to give you an idea, Tesla, uh, a large, uh, well-recognized company, has a valuation 60 times their EBITDA. That's their earnings before income tax, depreciation, amortization. Um, so that's 60 times earning, not 60 times revenue. So that just gives you an indication of how high these valuations are. The other thing I've noticed, these companies have extremely high overhead, their sales, general, and administrative expenses. They have very um, high uh, C-suite staffs. Also, it's not clear what these companies are. Are they ag tech companies or farm operators or both? And probably the biggest issue is there's a lack of standardization in the industry. It's very hard to compare companies. Uh, each has different growing technologies. And so it's hard to, to really do apple to apple comparisons. But what this does, it just gives you again, a state of the industry as I see it. So a couple of questions come from that chart is, can vertical farming be profitable? Uh, does total unit production cost decrease as a farm size increases? So basically, you know, I think at the beginning, when I first started, we all thought that if you build a bigger farm, your unit production cost should decrease. And lastly, what is the ideal vertical farm size? So uh, Dr. Eric Stein, uh, uh, professor uh, at Penn State and also the executive director for the Center of Excellence for Indoor Ag, we're working on trying to model this to come up with that answer. And when we started, uh, we thought this was a lot easier than it actually was, but uh, this gets very complicated and I'll walk through some of our logic. Um, so Dr. Steins developed a benchmarking uh, model to compare the efficiency of indoor farms. And we wanna create a model that will determine uh, unit production costs based on farm size to see if we can figure out what is that Goldilocks size of a farm. So when you look at total production cost or total product cost for a head of lettuce, uh, the equation that uh, typically is used is C, is the total cost to produce a head of lettuce. DM is the direct material cost. DL is the direct labor cost. O is the farm overhead cost. And U is the total units produced. So when we walk through this, I could show you where the challenges are is the direct material cost are things like your growing inputs, your seeds, your substrate, your fertilizer, your IPM, the utilities required to operate your grow room, your packaging and your shipping. This is fairly easy to calculate. DL is your direct labor costs. These are your grower, your production managers and farmers, the people that it takes to actually operate the farm. This is where it gets uh, tricky and complicated 
especially when there's a lack of standardization on how farms are built, financed, and operated. Um, this typically includes your rent, your capex, the amount of capital it takes to build that farm, and your sales, your gen uh, uh, sales generally, and administrative expenses. And this can vary greatly from a small farm to a big farm. And then lastly, U is the total units produced. It's the heads or pounds per year uh, of the produce produced, but also there's a qualitative factor there and that's the quality of produce produced. Uh, right now, we don't have any standard for farm yields and more importantly, shrink. And so I wanted to walk through that. So when you look at some of these costs, what I see out there in these well-capitalized farms is that traditional farms are very thinly uh, staffed. They have very little management. Usually in a farming operation, uh, uh, no one can sit behind the desk. Everybody's in the field. Um, uh, typically, the staff, the grower, the production managers, the farmers, the maintenance, compliance are all working in the farm. And then the management for these large farms, you see very heavy uh, C-suites and, and senior professionals. And I think it's very hard to make these farms profitable when you have this much overhead. Also, when you build a farm, your highest expenses are your LED lights and the electricity that it takes to go from that transformer to the lights. And uh, also your HVAC equipment and your rent. If you own a building, it's a little different, but if you rent a building, typically your TI or your tenant improvements, such as your infrastructure for your water, your electricity, your, your gas, your drainage, all can get very expensive and add to that CapEx. Something we don't talk a lot about in our industry is shrink. And shrink is defined as the loss of crop from seeding to shipping. And I think, uh, the profitability of a farm comes into how well it's operated so that you can grow a consistent high quality crop year round and reduce that shrink along the production cycle. So what you see is that when I have shrink here in the seeding process, it costs me pennies. If I uh, plant 105 seeds, 100 germinate, you know, I've only lost five seeds and those are pennies. But if I lose 100 packed heads of lettuce at shipping, that could be hundreds of dollars. And so as you lose uh, material along this process, your costs escalate. So, so one of the keys to operating a profitable farm is keeping this efficient and keeping your shrink down. The other challenge I see in vertical farming is sales and understanding that this is a highly, the produce market is highly stratified from wholesalers to produce distributors, to institutional kitchens, to retailers, to direct customers. And each of those customers will buy produce at a certain price. So the trick to being profitable is being able to get the most of your produce sold to the customers that'll pay the highest price. So uh, what I see is that there's a range of about 70% uh, off the highest price uh, based on where you sell that produce. So if you're growing and selling to a wholesaler, you'll probably get 30 cents on a dollar. If you're selling direct through an on-site retail location, you'll get 100% of that. And this is really what democratizes farming is being able to grow and cut out all the middle people and go direct to your, your customer. And, and, and that's something that I think we can do with vertical farms because we can place those anywhere. So understanding the stratification of the sales funnel and being able to get your highest price is critical. So the problem I see out there is how do we economically feed a growing global population using clean energy, no soil, and less water? So we all see that the population is growing, projected to be uh, between 9 to 10 billion by the year 2050. 
uh, we have less arable land per capita. So there's less farming land available and we've got a bigger population. Uh, water these days, either you have too little water and you're in a drought condition or you have too much water and you're in a flood condition, neither is good. And with COVID, we've really started to rethink our global supply chain. We found that it's very brittle to have a long supply chain. And we're seeing impacts on farming right now from fertilizers to substrate uh, to, to packaging. Um, so what we have to do is adapt to all these changes. And I think vertical farming and CEA is well poised to do that. I just saw today in the produce reporter that bad weather is causing lettuce uh, leaf prices to surge, that the poor weather in California has hit uh, lettuce crops, limiting the supply and rising prices. So I think that uh, you're gonna see more and more of this uh, country specific uh, from all these uh, elements. So what is our solution? So we've been working for three years in developing a modular scalable farm system. The first thing we figured out was what is the Goldilocks size of the farm that could allow you to grow the maximum density of crop in a monocrop grow room. And we built uh, this system, which is a hybrid uh, using a double poly forced air Gothic arch greenhouse system that we modified. We standardized the footprint so that we can put all our components in there, uh, such as your equipment room, your seating room, your germ room, your nursery, a monocrop grow room, and a packing room. We've also developed a, a, a robotic fan that traverses the length of the monocrop grow room and eradicates microclimates that allows you to grow more efficiently and reduce shrink. So I think our timing is really good that all these environmental challenges has created a perfect timing to, to develop a hyper local growing system that gets a high density of crop. And depending on the crop, we can get up to 26 harvests per year. We reduce transportation by getting this uh, right at the consumer and selling uh, direct to the customer. It's a turnkey solution from seed to shipping and it's sustainable. We could recycle our nutrient water, grow soil lists, grow free of pesticides, and we're economically feasible. We can use renewable energy. So what is our uniqueness? It's this inflatable structure. We've designed, as I said, the perfect uh, footprint that gives us maximum density and allows us only to climate control this grow area, which really keeps our operating costs down. It provides a low cost pest and thermal barrier. Um, it allows us to grow in monocrop grow rooms, 600 square feet. We can get between 40 to 50 four by eight foot grow tubs per grow room. It's modular so that as technology changes, we're adaptable and we could put in new technology. And as I said, we've also optimized our HVAC system to keep our, our uh, OPEX down. Our ro robotic vertical fan uh, moves on a track back and forth. Uh, fans are suspended that can blow right above the crop canopy. Uh, and you can put as many fans as you have levels. They also have sensors that allow you to collect temperature, relative humidity, and CO2 um, so that we can get three-dimensional maps of the grow room's climate, which allows you, again, to better control your HVAC system, improve your plant quality, reduce shrink, and increase profitability. Um, future farms, uh, are we're looking to actually have arms on the fan that can have uh, cameras and uh, uh, photo sensors so that we can look at plant quality, uh, IPM and LED light levels. We have a patent pending on this and we have a partnership with Rufipa, who's a Spanish greenhouse uh, manufacturer and builder where we have designed and built this uh, inflatable structure. So when you look at the financials here uh, through our tests, we've shown that this can be profitable uh, in year one and produce uh, uh, revenue based on growing uh, potted basil and lettuce. So um, 
that's what I wanted to share with you. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, uh, as a hydrogeologist, water is very sacred to me. And uh, the World Horty Center has this display that shows uh, how much water is used to grow uh, lettuce in a field farm, a greenhouse, and an indoor farm. And they show how little water you can use uh, when you recycle all your nutrient uh, uh, solution. So I think agriculture faces three limiting factors as the population grows, and that's soil, water, and energy. And what I'm happy to be part of this is that I think we're advancing the industry by developing this sustainable growing technology that allows farmers to grow soilless, use less energy, recycle the nutrient solution to get more crop per drop. So I'm Robert Colangelo and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, well, thank you so much, Robert. I really appreciate 